Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Canada's finance minister suddenly resigns. It's the right time for a new finance minister. Under pressure after the WE controversy and after reported disagreements with the prime minister, Bill Morneau steps down. Rosemary and that issue are standing by. New allegations against the governor general. Sources tell CBC News she's evading her security, taking unnecessary risks and it's costing Canadians. Cause can add up uh, disproportionately if you've got somebody that's not cooperating. Exclusive new details. Teachers give back to school plans a failing grade. Outrage first, disappointment, um, fear. The biggest classroom concerns for September. The CFL season sidelined. Uh, mixed emotions right now. The general emotions were pissed where it leaves the players, the fans, and the league. This is The National. After weeks of speculation, a sudden and major departure from the Liberal government tonight. Bill Morneau has announced he is out as finance minister, a decision he calls his own. Like any job, there's a time where you're the appropriate person in the role and the time where you have to decide when you're not the appropriate person in the role. Since I'm not running again, it's important that the Prime Minister has by his side a finance minister who has that longer-term vision. There had been reports of tension between Morneau and the Prime Minister for weeks. Bill Morneau has been a key part of this government in the position since the Liberals first took power back in 2015. But now his departure raises many questions, including who will take over the job of guiding a struggling economy in the midst of a pandemic. Pressure on Morneau had been building for weeks, but what led to the sudden move tonight? David Cochran begins our coverage. This is how it ends. The finance minister resigns as the government plots an economic recovery from a pandemic. I'll be stepping down as finance minister and as member of parliament for Toronto Centre. Bill Morneau has been the finance minister since day one of the Trudeau government and it seemed almost certain that he would stay. But now, a political divorce. Since I'm not running again, and since I expect that we will have a long and, and challenging recovery, I think it's important that the Prime Minister has by his side a finance minister who has that longer-term vision. The move comes after a week of stories quoting anonymous sources, speaking bluntly about the growing rift between the two, a series of articles that made Morneau's departure inevitable. Were you asked by the Prime Minister to resign? Uh, no. Uh, Tonda, this morning, I went to the Prime Minister and I tendered my resignation. Frank talk of the differences came after it was revealed that former Bank of Canada and former Bank of England Governor Mark Kearney was advising the Prime Minister on the pandemic response. Today, I wrote a check in payment of $41,366. And after Morneau compounded the damage from the Wii controversy by revealing he failed to pay for a trip he took with his family to Ecuador on the charity's dime. The Prime Minister didn't say who would replace Morneau, but issued a statement thanking him for his service and promising to support Morneau in his next move, because there's yet another twist. I still intend to continue to serve and have decided to put my name forward to become the next Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Gone from this job, already campaigning for the next. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, so let's bring in CBC's Chief Political Correspondent, Rosemary Barton. So, Rosie, you know, extraordinary move and clearly extraordinary timing. Yeah, extraordinary timing and, and a little strange, too, let's be honest. Uh, it was widely known that Bill Morneau probably wasn't going to run again in the next election. Um, so while the government may want to move ahead with a different economic agenda than Bill Morneau wanted to do, there are, of course, other factors here. And, and that would be primarily the pressure around Bill Morneau on, on the WE controversy and the fact that he didn't disclose and didn't pay back initially that travel money until he appeared in front of committee. That was a lot of pressure building on him. And as David well illustrated there in his story, Story, it had begin it had begun to spill out in, into the public and that wasn't something that was going to be tenable much longer but this leaves obviously a big problem for the government at a very critical moment well 
Yeah, but not just any departure. The, right. the hole he leaves is huge in the middle of the Liberal government. Yeah, because Bill Morneau, remember, came to this job not as a politician, and maybe that was one of the problems in, in his tenure here, but he had a lot of financial and economic uh, experience, and he used that to do some important things in terms of implementing the government's agenda. Now they have to find someone else who can either do it on an interim basis or someone who can do it permanently. There are a few contenders out there, Christia Freeland, Jean-Yves Duclos, uh, François-Philippe Champagne would be another but they need to do this quickly because the recovery is around the corner and the government needs to make some big policy decisions and it needs to make them quickly all right our chief political correspondent rosemary barton thanks rosie and stick around you know we had to call in that issue tonight andrew chantal and althea join rosie in less than 20 minutes we do have exclusive new details about a rift between governor general julie payette and the rcmp officers assigned to protect her at an annual cost of more than seven million dollars that cost is higher than for previous governors general in part because of payette's behavior ashley burke shows us why she's a symbol of canada that police are mandated to protect but rcmp sources say julie payette has made her disdain well known they claim she's tried to evade her protective detail, and that has pushed up costs. Those costs can add up uh, disproportionately if you've got somebody that's not cooperating. On foreign trips, says an RCMP source, she has slipped out of her hotel room at dawn to work at a loan. Mounties had to assign an additional member to guard her hotel door overnight. One police source estimates that cost an extra $4,000 to $15,000 per week. This former RCMP deputy commissioner said that kind of behavior would require around-the-clock monitoring. What would appear to be frustrating for the uh, RCMP officers involved is the fact that she, if she's playing a cat-and-mouse game, uh, this would, would create potentially embarrassing situation for both the governor general, the RCMP, and it could potentially put the general public at risk as well. Sources say Payette has also routinely kept the RCMP in the dark about her plans only then to submit last-minute requests. That means additional overtime, hotel rooms, and commercial flights at triple the cost. These last-minute things create all kinds of sort of uh, causing the RCMP to operate in a, in a state of flux. Uh, they have to react rather than be planned, which also creates uh, a heightened level of, of, I would think, security issues. Sources say the RCMP has had to apologize for Payette's treatment of foreign security. They say she's yelled at local police for getting too close, criticized their driving, and even had one member replaced because he was too tall and stood out. Payette's press secretary says the governor general has tremendous respect for the RCMP, and cost-saving measures are at the heart of all decisions. She added Payette's security costs are in line with those of her predecessors during what's been a busy two years. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. We have more details tonight about the cyber attacks on federal accounts that compromise the personal information of thousands of Canadians. As Allison Northcott explains, they hit nearly twice as many accounts as originally thought. And when I was looking through, I noticed that uh, my banking information had changed. Jennifer Fink is one of thousands of Canadians targeted in a string of recent cyber attacks. Initially, 5,500 federal government accounts were believed to have been hacked. Today, officials said more than 11,000 were affected. The government of Canada has been taking action to respond to attacks called credential stuffing. The federal government says the attacks targeted the Canada Revenue Agency and an online portal Canadians use to access government services like immigration applications and veterans benefits. This is not an attack where a, a hacker is trying to go through the back door. They are going into the system just like normal users. They are applying credentials just like normal users. So it's very hard to detect that pattern. He says hackers exploited a vulnerability in security software to bypass security questions and that usernames and passwords stolen in previous breaches from third parties were also used to access accounts. As for who is behind this, the government says that's now part of an RCMP investigation. Those hackers bet on the fact that people most of the time are reusing the same password over and over again. It's why experts say usernames and passwords should be unique and changed often, and you should watch financial accounts closely. But some say the government needs stronger security measures. Well, the reality is that this should have never happened in the first place. And CRA owes all Canadians an explanation as to why their personal financial information has not been kept safe and secure. 
The government says anyone whose account was affected will get a letter in the mail with instructions on what to do next. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. So this is a big night in American politics, night one of four for the Democratic National Convention, but it's a dramatically changed event because of the pandemic. Susan Ormiston takes us to Milwaukee, where the convention was supposed to be taking over right about now. Barricaded streets, but almost no one's here. The cash cow of a Democratic convention in Milwaukee evaporated with COVID. Police staring down empty streets. Potentially $200 million lost from restaurants and hotels in the city. People are not working and folks were looking forward to this week, not only to log those hours that they need to be able to put food on the table for themselves and their families, but also to put a spotlight on this city. At first, 50,000 people were supposed to come to the Pfizer Forum, home of the Milwaukee Bucks and co-owned by the Lasry family. It sucked. Um, there's, there's really no other way to say it. Alex Lasry and a team worked a year and a half just to lure the Democrats here. It's just a gut punch um, and it's disappointment um, and it's, it's a bit of a letdown because we worked so hard and we were so excited to show the world um, why Milwaukee was chosen. So how does all this turn into the exciting political schmooze fest of the past? Typically, conventions energize political junkies for the long campaign slog ahead and catch a bounce for the party. Reverend Leah Daughtry, she ran two of the last conventions. Will it be the same as a balloon drop for the first African-American uh, vice presidential nominee? No, it won't, but I think they'll come pretty close. This year, the Wisconsin Center is just a production hub for a virtual event live streamed over four nights. How are you going to be watching the Democratic Convention? On multiple social media Democratic channels and TV, speeches will be pre-taped or live, but remotely. We've got great uh, producers. We've got all, or nearly all of Hollywood on the Democratic side. But just to stick it to the Dems, Trump made a pit stop today in Wisconsin. I wonder, is Joe Biden taping his speech too? Because if he is, I think I'll tape mine. Milwaukee's time to shine on Lake Michigan is upended, along with everything else. Sad because there was so much hype for the city and it was supposed to be like Milwaukee's year. Not to be. So Susan, a lot of big names taking part tonight. Michelle Obama among them, what was her message? Well, I'm in a backyard garden in Milwaukee, Adrian. The function of COVID and the cancellation of the in-person convention, it's just wrapping up here. And yes, they were listening to Michelle Obama who talked about Biden's character. He listens, he tells the truth, he'll be a good manager. And she had this to say about the current president. Donald Trump is the wrong president for our country. He has had more than enough time to prove that he can do the job, but he is clearly in over his head. He cannot meet this moment. He simply cannot be who we need him to be for us. Adrian, this is night one of four for the Democrats. You know, it's going to be tough for them to keep people tuning in for eight hours of convention coverage and speeches without the hijinks and hysteria that you know all too well from the convention floor. So it's all live streamed this time. This is the kickoff for campaign 2020, Adrian but it really doesn't feel that way yet. Wow, what a different world. Thank you, Susan. Susan Ormiston in Milwaukee tonight. For Canada, too, will be getting a taste of political campaigning during a pandemic. Today, New Brunswick's premier sets September 14th as election day in that province. Harry Forstell shows us that voter reluctance is just one symptom of COVID-19. Premier Blaine Higgs' visit with the lieutenant governor today was pure tradition. The election it triggers, he promised, will be anything but. This will be an election like none other, probably, in, in North America has ever been conducted in the, in the past. While still in the grip of a public health crisis, New Brunswick has weathered COVID-19 better than most provinces. Even so, opposition leaders criticized Higgs' move as reckless and unnecessary. The Premier of New Brunswick chose political opportunism instead of the health and safety of our citizens. We all unanimously agreed to withhold and to postpone municipal elections. 
And we did it because of the pandemic. So despite municipal elections being put on hold, now it seems okay to have a provincial election. It's very um, alarming that the Premier has called an election during the pandemic uh, when people are so concerned with their health, with the health of their children, the health of their elders. Higgs made no apologies, saying he'd already cleared the vote with the province's top doctor. Can we do it safely? Absolutely. Are we going to change how we do it? Most certainly. According to New Brunswick's chief electoral officer, most of those changes will be noticeable at the polls. We're going to ask them to wear masks. Um, there's going to be uh, physical distancing, markers on the floor. But with COVID-19 still a threat and just weeks before schools reopen, news of the September election drew mixed reactions. It's weird to be having an election during a global pandemic. I probably wouldn't be one of the first ones to rush out and go vote. The world should keep moving. There are other changes voters might find more appealing. Higgs says he'll forbid progressive conservative candidates from knocking on doors and handing out campaign brochures. It's not clear if other parties will follow suit. Harry Forrestal, CBC News, Fredericton. Canada's COVID case count jumped today after both BC and Alberta reported three days worth of cases at once. British Columbia added 236 new cases and now has the most active cases it's ever had. Alberta went even higher, adding 359 new cases. Nearly half of those were confirmed on Friday. It also added three new deaths. Manitoba added 38 new cases as it tries to push back against a recent surge. Newfoundland and Labrador will make masks mandatory in indoor public spaces starting next Monday. Today, parents also learn students in grades 7 and up, and school staff as well will have to wear masks in common areas when school returns. Bus capacity also being cut, meaning about 6,000 students will have to find another way to school. It's an additional layer of protection in addition to all the other layers of protection that are built into the safety plan. British Columbia also announced a new mask policy today for students. Middle and secondary students will now need to wear them in places like hallways where physical distancing is much harder to maintain. Now with different COVID-19 protocols in different provinces, parents aren't the only ones concerned about school. As Karen Pauls tells us, teachers across the country are worried too about the risk for themselves, their students and their own kids. Lauren Hope says Manitoba's return to school blueprint falls short of expectations. Had I given this assignment to my students and given them five months to come up with a plan, I, I would fail all of them on what they came back with. In Manitoba, masks are only mandatory on school buses for students in grade five and up. Schools are responsible for proper ventilation and scheduling small student cohorts. Outrage first, disappointment, um, fear. Hope's social media posts have prompted the formation of an advocacy group inspired by a safe September rally in Nova Scotia last week. I can't think of a day that has gone by in the previous 14 years of my career where I haven't been at eye level with a student sitting at a desk. Christine Emberly is a Halifax high school teacher and a safe September organizer. It's really nice to see the support across the country, but also it tells us that this isn't unique to our province. It tells us that, that governments haven't yet been listening to the full breadth of concerns that we have about sending our kids back to school next month. Fun safe schools! In Ontario, Safe September is funneling anger over class sizes, no masks mandated for students grade three and under, and inadequate ventilation. There has not been adequate money provided to school boards uh, since the late 90s to e even properly maintain the buildings. And now we're paying for it. Certainly teachers and many parents have been saying for years we need smaller class sizes. Now it's a health and safety concern. And teachers say a threat to public health. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. A COVID-19 alert has been issued for northern BC after those who went to a prayer meeting tested positive. The It Is Time conference happened between July 30th and August 2nd in Deadwood, Alberta. Health officials say there are 17 cases, most of them in the Fort St. John area, but the public exposure advisory applies to all of northeastern BC. Count the CFL's 2020 season among the pandemic's economic casualties. 
it's been sidelined after a bid for federal aid was turned down. And as Devin Haru explains, that has players wondering about the league's ability to return to the field. The Blue Lovers, 2019 Grey Cup champions. There was a small glimmer of hope that the Grey Cup would be hoisted in 2020, a shortened season starting in September with Winnipeg as a host hub city. That was the plan. Today, those Grey Cup dreams were dashed for hundreds of players and thousands of football fans. We are absolutely committed to our you know, focus on the 21, 2021 season and beyond the, and a bright future for the Canadian Football League. It comes just a day after the federal government denied the CFL a $30 million interest-free loan, leaving the league and its players wondering, what next? I'm here right now training for 2021 season. In the gym, trying to stay motivated, Jordan Reeves is a defensive lineman in the heartland of football, Saskatchewan, where the CFL thrives. For months, players wanted answers about this season, feeling shut out from the conversation and not getting paid. I'm getting a lot of uh, mixed emotions right now, but um, the general emotions were pissed from that, uh, you know. I, I love football for the camaraderie. You know, I love, I love the locker room. All those guys are my family. A lot of guys are going to have to find work elsewhere um, to make up the loss in finances that guys will be missing in, uh, for this season. You know, it should be a wake-up call for a lot of us. And a wake-up call for the league, too. Part of what we have to face is the disappointment that we're all going to endure. And I'm thinking today about our players and feeling for them the cancelled season means the Grey Cup will not be awarded for the first time since 1919. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, we head to Ottawa for special coverage of Bill Morneau's resignation. I'll be stepping down as finance minister and as member of parliament for Toronto Centre. Up next, Rosie and at issue on the exit of the finance minister. Plus, as Conservatives get set to elect a new party leader this weekend, we take a close look at the candidates. And the raps on the road to repeat, boosted by magic messages from family far away. Say go, Daddy! Go, Daddy! We're back in two. It's the right time for a new finance minister to deliver on that plan for the long and challenging road ahead. That's why I'll be stepping down as Finance Minister and as Member of Parliament for Toronto Centre. A big shakeup in Ottawa tonight. Bill Morneau has resigned as Finance Minister and from his seat as an MP. So what was the breaking point? Who is up next for the job? We had to call in at issue for this. They don't ever get a break. Chantelle Hibert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. Thank you all for coming back. You're going to have to come back uh, for the Conservative leadership too. But but let's start with today. Uh, Chantelle, when we last talked about this a couple weeks back, uh, you you seem to seem to believe that Bill Morneau was not long for his job, and here we are. What what do you make of the reasons he gave tonight, and what do you think they really are? When I told you that uh, two weeks ago, I had not yet uh, witnessed what we all witnessed, which was a uh, finance minister left hanging uh, in the wind in the media for the better part of that time. Uh, and what led to that, I don't actually believe it's just the uh, we stuff and, and the trip. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Bill Morneau and the Prime Minister had become, and that's becoming a familiar story with this government, uh, that the Prime Minister becomes uh, detached, disconnected from his ministers. And at some point, if it had been me, instead of Bill Morneau watching uh, the coverage uh, and the sources saying this and that, mm. I guess uh, I would have uh, decided that someone wanted me to resign. And and the, the way that this happened, Andrew, that this bid for the Secretary General of the OECD, sh sh how should we read that, do you think? Uh, it's a ridiculous cover story that you would leave as G7 finance minister in the middle of the worst economic crisis in a century when huge decisions are being made to have a maybe possible shot at the Secretary General of OECD, which is not a particularly 
important post, frankly. I think the only reason they hit on that story was to make the philosophical difference cover story seem uh, more plausible by comparison. But I don't find it particularly credible either that suddenly there's this huge gulf in vision between the finance minister and the prime minister uh, that suddenly Bill Morneau, who's presided over larger and larger deficits year after year after year, is suddenly recast as this skinflint who's somehow standing in the way of the prime minister's vision. It, none of that makes sense either. So I guess I'm more in the camp that said uh, this was a dignified way to throw Mr. Morneau, Mr. Morneau overboard without having to raise uncomfortable questions as to why the prime minister should not have to walk the plank for the same sins. Uh, Althea, what, what, what do you make of the reasoning or the explanations that Mr. Morneau gave today? Well, I think on this uh, panel, we all agree that the Prime Minister's office basically engineered uh, Bill Morneau's way uh, out of office. Um, the we story, um, if they had focused on that, would only cast uh, attention on the fact that the Prime Minister was unwill unwilling to resign for the very same offenses that they were saying Mr. Morneau had to go. Um, the differences uh, in ideology between Mr. Morneau and Mr. Trudeau have been well known for several years. Uh, he was very uncomfortable with the level of um, federal largesse, shall we say, that was in the very first budget. And at the time, there were other people in the cabinet who also shared uh, his views, like uh, Mr. Bryson, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we did not hear um, at the time from Mr. Morneau. Mr. Morneau has not been the Jim Flaherty of yeah. the Trudeau government. He has not tried to, behind the scenes, let it known that he disagrees with Mr. Trudeau on these things. He's been fiercely loyal. And for that loyalty, he has been rewarded with <laughs> basically like a, a smear campaign of sorts that Mr. Trudeau could have put an end to if he had wanted to, and he chose not to. Okay, so Chantal, you can riff off that if you want, but we are now, you know, at, at the end of the first wave of, of a pandemic. I'm not sure we've ever in this country been in uh, a recession, depression, without a finance minister. Uh, who, who should we expect? How soon should we expect it? Probably tomorrow, I'm thinking. But what what is your sense of the urgency around that? Well, there is, uh, it would be unheard of to have an interim finance minister. So yes, the expectation that we will have a finance minister tomorrow makes a lot of sense. Those uh, who still believe that uh, someone like Mark Carney is about to set onto the scene and run in a by-election, everything we hear tonight is that that is not happening. Mm -hmm. So expect someone who is currently in cabinet to become the finance minister. That's the general expectation. Whether that will reassure Canadians who are increasingly worried about the management, not of the pandemic, but of the, of the fiscal consequences of the pandemic is very much an open question. Mm -hmm. uh, to have a rookie finance minister, who, even someone who is actually in cabinet at a time like this, is uh, not only particularly challenging, but not confidence inspiring. And, and, and the, the challenges that that finance minister has to encounter very quickly, uh, Andrew, even if they've been around the cabinet table already, are, are I mean, will, will remain unprecedented even the months ahead. Yeah, and the biggest challenge is that the, the prime minister is the real finance minister. Uh, he ran the table with Mr. Morneau, frankly, over the years, uh, as his people were boasting about uh, in, behind the scenes in, uh, in these anonymous leaks over the last few days. So whoever comes in there, it's a thankless job because your job as finance minister is to say no, to be the skeptic, to be asking those kind of questions. And if it's clear that the finance, the prime minister now views a $343 billion deficit as not nearly enough and that we need to go into much grander levels of debt, um, that's, that, that's a pretty thankless assignment. Although, uh, Althea, if you appoint someone who you know is sort of on the same page as you, perhaps you, you, you removed all the obstacles and challenges that you were presumably going to encounter with Bill Morneau. Although you have to pause for a second and think, do you want a cabinet with only members who agree with you? Or do you want to have sure. real policy discussion? And you kind of need that back and forth. And I thought it was interesting today when, you know, I asked uh, Minister Moner what he thought the next finance, what skill set yeah. he thought the next finance minister should have. And he said, well, that's not up to me to decide. It's up to the, to, uh, the prime minister. And 
you could have easily made an argument for Mark Carney, who I am told is definitely not going to be the mm -hmm, finance mm -hmm. minister. But, you know, this is a government that likes to virtue signal and say, you know, so-and-so, first female finance minister, let's say, appointed, as many of us expect it to be, Christia Freeland. But um, if you had to put a white man in that job, you could have said, well, no one really has the credentials that Mark Carney has. But there is nobody at the cabinet table at the moment that has <laughs> credentials, financial credentials, frankly, that are better than Minister Mornos. Mm -hmm. So um, it will be up to them to try to explain that decision. I, I just have a couple of minutes, but what does this, I'm not going to ask you about an election because I, I, I don't think that's what it is, <laughs> but what does this do to the government's attempt to try and end the talk around we, the we controversy, and turn the page and move to other things? Does it help? Does it hurt, Chantal? Well, uh, if you're going to take a controversy that for many Canadians remains a, a small controversy and change the channel to a bigger uh, controversy, which is do we have uh, a team that is equipped to deal with what may be coming down the road with the pandemic, uh, that, that's, you know, one way to change the channel, I guess, to lose your finance minister in the middle of a huge crisis. As to Altio's point about having people around the cabinet table that can uh, not always be yes people, mm -hmm. I think we may be way past that in the case of this government, considering the list of people who have left, mm -hmm. uh, who came with Justin Trudeau to cabinet uh, in 2015. Interesting. Uh, Andrew, qu just quickly on whether you think this marks, I mean, obviously it's a turning point, but whether it's the one that the government wants or not. I can't see this uh, quieting talk of the we controversy when the finance minister is its most uh, visible and prominent uh, victim. Uh, you know, we keep having these scandals that liberal partisans dismiss as nothing burgers that result in high level resignations. Uh, that's not particularly going to make this go away. Althea? Oh, I agree with that. And uh, usually the ethics commissioner continues reports well into whether or not you have resigned. So uh, we should expect that there will be a pronouncement on Mr. Morneau's uh, ethical failings, alleged ethical failings, as well as the prime minister's uh, you know, shortly, perhaps in time for an election. This is a remarkable day, right? I mean, this isn't something that we have seen. Uh, I mean, we've seen it before, but nothing like this. Am I wrong, Chantel? Uh, no. No, but then uh, remember that we spent an entire weekend not being able to this day to say whether Paul Martin had been fired or yeah. resigned. Right. Uh, and, and the loss of Paul Martin to Jean Chrétien was a serious hit. Uh, that Jim Flaherty cut the legs from under uh, Stephen Harper's uh, top campaign economic promise, fiscal promise uh, on income splitting uh, on his way out. So. It is not yeah. unheard of for prime ministers and ministers of finance to become estranged. They tend not to be doing that less than a year after an election and in the middle of a huge crisis. Okay. Thank you all. I appreciate you all coming in. Please stay by your phones. I'm likely to call again very soon. <laughs> Chantel, Andrew, and Althea. At least they get to stay home and do it. All right. That is ish at issue for uh, today. Back to Andrew and uh, Adrian in Toronto. All right, thanks, Rosie. When we come back, the president of Belarus digs in, and so do the protesters. <laughs> Booed by workers at what he thought would be a friendly rally. As protesters continue to flood the streets, what options are left a week into the turmoil? Plus, the Toronto Raptors' playoff dreams start on a high note. Dreams of a repeat ahead. Welcome back. A $16.5 million settlement was reached in a class action lawsuit over mass arrests during the G20 summit in Toronto 10 years ago. Shame, 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 shame. Toronto police arrested about 1,100 people during that summit. The deal says each will be entitled to compensation between five and $25,000. Those wrongfully arrested will also have their police records wiped. Overseas, the police crackdown on protesters in Belarus only seems to fuel the movement. Today, a nationwide strike stepped up the pressure for Alexander Lukashenko to resign. And as Margaret Evans tells us, the longtime president was even heckled in public. The people versus the strongman, day eight. In the air, Alexander Lukashenko arriving at a tractor factory. On the ground, the protesters he wanted to avoid demanding he step down. 
but he miscalculated if he thought the workers inside, once part of his traditional base, were going to give him a free pass. You've always supported the president, he told them, but they contradicted him, shouting no, no. When he finished speaking, he said they could carry on shouting, and they did. He left the stage to chance of resign. It's increasingly difficult to see how he can avoid it without a lifeline from Russian President Vladimir Putin or a return to the force he employed so brutally last week, arresting thousands of those who accused him of stealing their election. Many say they were beaten and tortured. Maria Kolesnikova is one of the few opposition figures not jailed. Thank you for not being afraid, she's saying to the crowd. We're not the little people, we're the nation. Today, another opposition leader, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who fled to Lithuania, called on Belarusian security forces to stand down. If you decide not to carry out your illegal orders and switch to the side of the people, she said, they will forgive you. The European Union has called a virtual meeting for Wednesday to discuss potential sanctions against the government. On the street, the protesters seem to be adding to their numbers with each passing day. But Lukashenko, dubbed Europe's last dictator, has clung to power for 26 years. And he hasn't given up yet. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Still ahead on the national round one, game one. And they take game number one. A great start for the defending champions. The NBA playoffs are on. We'll take you to Orlando just ahead. Plus, another battle underway, the conservative leadership race. Right after this, we continue our series diving into the candidates. We will win when we boldly confront the Liberals and offer a positive, principled, conservative alternative for our country. That was Aaron O'Toole back in June, making his pitch to Conservative Party members that he can lead them to victory against the Trudeau Liberals. We've been looking at the four candidates for that leadership role ahead of the final results expected Sunday. Here's Vashi Capellos, the host of Power and Politics, with a snapshot of Aaron O'Toole. Is third time the charm for Aaron O'Toole? The country needs a strong Conservative Party. O'Toole first sought to be the interim Conservative Party leader after Stephen Harper lost the 2015 election and resigned as leader. But Ronna Ambrose won that round. Have you made a decision yet? I'm talking to my colleagues uh, over the next few days. Two years later, O'Toole ran for the leadership again. We need to build on the strengths of, and successes of our past while actively seeking opportunities to win back the trust of Canadians. The next Prime Minister of Canada. But lost that race to Andrew Scheer. O'Toole was first elected in 2012 in Durham, a riding in the 905 area that surrounds Toronto. Like his main rival, Peter McKay, O'Toole is also the son of a politician. This is another broken promise to the region of Durham. John O'Toole represented the region provincially in the Ontario legislature for nearly 20 years. It's an honor for me to serve our veterans. A veteran himself, a former Air Force navigator, O'Toole became Minister of Veterans Affairs at the tail end of the Harbour government. We have to show that we will fight for jobs and opportunity for all Canadians. As he seeks to lead the party once again, O'Toole wants it to run in one lane only. We need strong leadership to unite our party, take the hyphen out of being a conservative. And put itself on a war footing. Join our fight. Let's take back Canada. For what is O'Toole's third and perhaps final fight for this leadership prize. Vashi Capellos, CBC News, Ottawa. And we'll have more on the Conservative leadership race all week, what you need to know about the other candidates, and what's at stake for the party, all leading up to next Sunday. Our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, will host special coverage on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and CBC Gem. We'll have the results and analysis throughout the evening, followed by a special ad issue panel right here on The National. When we come back, the road to repeat. The Toronto Raptors began their playoff journey in Orlando today. But first, 
we wanted to show you a few special moments that happened before the game. Playing in the NBA bubble away from fans and family isn't easy. But today, before the big game, the players got a little message from home. Number 33, my daddy, Margasol. Number 43, Pascal Siakam. Let's go, Raptors! The rap starting lineup shouted out by their own personal hype team. Families cheering them on. Number 23. You can see on those faces just how much those messages of support mean coming from so far away. Say go, Daddy! Go, Daddy! From far and wide, oh, Canada. Well, it might just be the coolest rendition of the national anthem in Raptors history. Toronto native Jesse Reyes kneeling atop the CN Tower to launch the team's quest for back-to-back -back NBA championships. For the well, that's an unforgettable start for a playoff run unlike any other. As Jamie Strachan shows us, both the defending champs and their fans will have some changes to get used to. What a difference a year makes. One year after an entire city and country cheered every shot. Is this the dagger? And big moment of the Raptors championship season. The Raptors and Nets. This year's playoffs are a lot different and a lot quieter. The Raptors started their title defense this afternoon against the Brooklyn Nets inside the NBA's Orlando bubble. You know, everybody's saying, well, home court doesn't matter, and, this, and I'm not so sure that's the case. Coach Nick Nurse says with the Raptors logo on the floor and virtual fans in the stands, it kind of feels like home. I know the fans are there virtually, but there's still some familiar people you see. They're certainly in the colors and the jerseys and, and um, you know, showing some love for, for the Raps. It's the biggest thing I've, I own that is shows that we're the champions. Jay Rosales, host of the popular That's a Rap podcast, says without the ability to attend games or gather in places like Jurassic Park, fans are adjusting. People are going to be screaming the roofs off of their houses, so it's definitely going to be different, but from a, a Raptors fan's perspective, I think that all in all the same. Not quite Jurassic Park, but this Jurassic parking lot, just one venue here in Toronto, where fans are desperately trying to recreate the excitement of last year's magical playoff run. Fans gathered to watch the game drive-in style on the big screen. It's so nice to get out and feel the hype of everybody. And on a rainy day, it was the perfect place to cheer on the home team. Let's go, the love from up north penetrated the NBA's bubble. I knew the Raptors would be okay. The Raptors rolled over the Nets by 24 points. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next on The National, the story of a woman and her dog. They met as kids and grew up together. Now she hopes he'll be at her wedding. Boots, the 21-year-old dog, is next. Well, this is Boots and his owner, Charlie Burke, from PEI. The two are celebrating Boots's 21st birthday. Now, Boots has been by Charlie's side through first relationships, first children, and now hopefully on her wedding day, their journey is our moment. My parents got him for me for my fifth birthday, and he was the runt of a litter. He's 21 in a week now almost. Yeah, he's been there for like everything. <laughs> everything from kindergarten graduation to high school graduation. Uh, my grandmother died last year, and he spent 18 hours straight in bed with me. He didn't get up to go pee or anything. The birth of my daughter, she's four months now. He doesn't really have any interest in her, but I got him when I was five, and at 25 I had my first child, and I have pictures of them together, so that's crazy. I plan on getting married next summer with hopefully COVID over. My nephew will be able to come home from Alberta, so... But if Boots is still around next year, it'll be 
a bow tie to match the groomsman and my fiance, and he'll be there. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> We're all crossing our fingers, and 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 so it'll it will not surprise you at all to know that Boots, according to his owner, has something of an attitude, a bit of a sassy dog apparently, but also a survivor, a uh, heart failure, kidney disease, a tumor on his lip, and a heart murmur. He's beat them all. Okay, well hang in there, Boots. Um, apparently, if Boots lives a little bit longer, like maybe till midway through the year next year, of course, till the wedding, mm -hmm. he'll be in the top ten of aged dogs in the history books, the oldest wow. being 29. And I, I know you didn't necessarily need to know that. But no, I you did. Do. I did. <laughs> that is a national for Monday, August 17th. Good night. Good night.